So uh, last time we, 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 uh, we argued that uh, if you take Maxwell equations and then you freeze everything at a at given time so that uh, you don't have any change in your fields with time, then the, the, the set of Maxwell equations, they split, they split in two sets, right? One that uh, is only, uh, uh, it has to do only with the electric field, this, and then the other set that uh, has to do only with the magnetic field. So that's a very nice feature of these equations because the, uh, you, you see in this uh, static situation you, you can uh, discuss independently the electric field and the magnetic field. A thing that you are not able to do uh, when you have all them mixed up. Also you, vice versa, I mean you can uh, argue that uh, uh, it's true that the electric and the magnetic fields are connected but only when they are varying time. So if you have an electric field where in time uh, you may expect some magnetic fields. Uh, in fact, then you have to solve the couple equations. And vice versa, if you have a varying B fields in the game, then uh, you will uh, induce some electric fields. And we will see that uh, uh, later on. But for the moment, uh, uh, we follow s roughly the uh, historical development in which uh, uh, they first discover sort of uh, these equations. I mean, as, as you see, this is essentially Coulomb law, as we will rederive in a second. Uh, and this uh, we will talk uh, about uh, a little later. And what we said is that because of the property, properties of the, uh, of the uh, of vector calculus, any time you have a, a vector uh, that is curl uh, free, right, like the electric field here, that means that uh, you can always derive uh, this from uh, a, a gradient of a scalar function, okay, so this is a vector field, this is a, is a, is a scalar field, and every time you have a, a divergence less uh, 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 field, right, this because uh, can always be derived from a curl of a vector that we call it A. And this uh, we call it, uh, uh, this is the electric scalar potential. They are lost in the, in the storm. Okay, so here you have a nice exercise that you can try over the weekend, I mean it's trivia, so uh, to verify indeed that if you have a, a vector field, it's true that uh, if, if you take the curve of, uh, of uh, uh, the curve of a scalar field, okay, so this vanishes. So just plug in the components and verify that this is true. And also that if you have uh, the divergence of a curl, uh, I mean of the curl of a, of a vector, these two vanishes, okay? So that you, <coughs> so that's an exercise. <coughs> and we solve it on, together on Monday. So as I said, now we, we, we forget for, for, for a moment about the magnetic field and we focus on the electric field. And this subject is uh, called electrostatics for obvious reasons. So the first things uh, that uh, we would like to see is that uh, since uh, what we knew about electrostatics is essentially the Coulomb force, that two charges, right, two charges uh, attract and repel each other. In this case, they attract with a force that is uh, proportional to the product of the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So how is this information uh, encoded in these, I mean, they look very much different, 
uh, how is this information encoded here, right? Because this equation uh, it becomes sort of a, a constraint that allows us to write the uh, uh, electric field in terms of the potentials, and we are going to exploit this in a second. Uh, so the dynamical equations is really this, right? And uh, this doesn't look much like a F equal Q square over R square, so uh, how do we get back that? I think this I gave it as an exercise, so uh, but let's do it together. In fact, we, we, we can do both way, right? Uh, how do we get from this to Coulomb law and vice versa? By if you know Coulomb law, how Maxwell, uh, well, actually, not even Maxwell, but uh, 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 rewrote that uh, uh, force law in terms of this uh, divergence of the electric field. Uh, so let's, uh, uh, let's do the, the first things. So I know the Coulomb law because I've been in a, in a laboratory. Hello. You made it. <laughs> um, so we know the, uh, and, and we want to compute, uh, to, to verify that indeed if Coulomb's law is true, then uh, you have that the divergence of the, your electric field uh, is, uh, uh, is equal to, is proportional to the density of charge. So to do that, uh, we just, uh, hello, okay, here they come. So the, to do that, uh, the, uh, it's easier uh, to, to use the, uh, the, this Gauss law in the integral form. So in the integral form, what you have is that uh, the electric field Right. You remember, the, the, if you have a, a, some surface, right, uh, and you have uh, this, okay, and, and uh, then you have your electric field. Remember the electric field, uh, okay. So the Gauss law tells you what happens if you integrate over this surface, and you start with a small area, like, uh, let's call it, uh, I don't know, ds, uh, the Gauss uh, law tells you that if you take the, the component of the vector field, right, uh, uh, normal to, to this surface, then you integrate, you get uh, something. But uh, here I, uh, I don't know yet what that something is because uh, I'm playing around and assuming that I don't know Gauss law. So if I have the electric field, I just compute this, uh, I mean, not knowing anything, uh, but I know that uh, uh, if I have some charges here, the electric, the force, okay, hello, uh, uh, is going to be uh, Coulomb, uh, Coulomb's law. So let me put uh, the Coulomb, so I have a charge inside, for instance, and so the electric field is, is what, is the, okay, so we one by one, they, they arrive. Is someone still missing or? So we are uh, rederiving Gauss law. From Coulomb, from the Coulomb force that I assume you, you, you already know from uh, previous studies. So to do that, I, I, I look at the integral form of Gauss laws, right? That is an integral over a certain surface. And I take this surface to include in, in, the, in the volume included by this surface, I have a charge Q. So I know that the electric field on the surface, <coughs> on this surface, is what is, uh, remember that uh, the electric field essentially is, uh, if you have a, a, 
a test charge, right, like, uh, like this. Really, you should take the, the limit where this goes uh, uh, to zero. I mean, okay, all that stuff, but uh, roughly is a, is a unit of force, you know, uh, per unit charge, so that this is just like the, this is the other charge, uh, and it's like the test charge, right? You, you go there with the test charge, and you measure uh, what is your electric field there due to the other charge, okay? So I should uh, give a different name here. So this is like this. What? The? This one, you, you mean? Yeah. Well, just to keep track of the direction. Yeah. Ah, the one over epsilon. Uh, 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 that's right. I did it in the Gauss units. Okay. But I told you that this is going to be. So I, I will end up with the four pi instead of one. So in our units, essentially four pi, I guess, is equal to epsilon naught, right? And yeah, ideally, that should be equal to one, so that we don't have to worry. But unfortunately, here we are not. Uh, one over epsilon, right? So, like this. but if they are equal to one, then we are. Uh, you see, this is a problem with the, the measuring things that you get all these units, and and, uh, and of course you would like some natural units, uh, as you heard from uh, Arcani Ahmed the, the lecture. So it's very useful to use, right? Some units uh, in particle physics that is very easy, right? Because you put the h. Uh, uh, slash and c equal to one, and you get this nice set of units. Uh, here is more complicated, so okay, this is this is just a joke. So don't don't write it. Uh, okay, so we'll end up with the four pi instead of one over epsilon, or I should put here, I guess. Okay, let's do it this way so that so that we we get the uh, SI units. And uh, okay, so I have everything because I use Coulomb law. So this is comes from Coulomb. Uh, and now, if I do this integral, right, uh, and I look what I get, uh, I should get uh, this, okay? Uh, because then I know that uh, by using, uh, uh, I can transform this uh, uh, surface integral, right, uh, into a divergence and get the differential form of the, the law. So how, how do I do that exactly? Uh, well, I only have to, 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 to do this. Uh, so, so how does it work? Maybe let's do it uh, carefully. So I have, uh, so I have let's say this is the, uh, this small surface. Now I, I take the, the, the other cut. Uh, uh, so this surface has a normal vector that I call n. And, uh, and here is the charge, q, OK? So, uh, the, the, the force, uh, you see, is, uh, is in the same direction as the r. So, well, this is not. So let's put it here so that I get. So th this is the, the direction of, of uh, <coughs> right? And uh, uh, so if I take the, the, the so this is normal to the surface. This is the orthogonal plane to R. Okay, so here I identify an angle theta that uh, I'm supposed to, to integrate over. So you see that uh, the cosine of theta, the cosine of theta times the surface is equal to R square, the solid angle over which uh, I'm, uh, I'm supposed to, to integrate. That means that here I can keep on going Uh, right, I have this uh, 4 pi. So you see this, I, I get uh, this is 1 over 4 pi epsilon, not. Uh, okay, then I have this Q over R square. Then this term here, this term here, you see through, through these uh, relations is just, uh, so this is the cosine of theta ds. So I get R square d omega. Therefore, I get exactly Q over 4 pi epsilon naught. Uh, the omega. 
omega. And now I, so, so the, when, when I do the integral over the entire surface, I only have to do the integral over the, the, the solid, uh, uh, I mean, the spherical surface that, uh, I mean, the angle of, a, of a, a closed surface that you know is just, uh, so if you do this, you get the 4 pi, right? 4 pi is the, if you go around, and so you see that you get indeed q over epsilon naught. That, of course, this is q is uh, what you get when you integrate the density of charge inside the volume is the total charge that you have. And in our case, I just had the q. So indeed, I get that. So this is the divergence of E equal to q over epsilon, right? But uh, to get the divergence, I have to, to, to write q as the integral over this volume. So I get the density of charge indeed. So, okay, this was kind of trivial, but uh, uh, it serves the purpose of, uh, of really hammering in the fact that this is just Coulomb's law. It's just a, a, a cool way of writing Coulomb's law, okay? Instead of uh, as a force, you write it as a property of the field, and then you connect the divergence of this field to the charges inside the volume. Of course, it is similarly simple to go the other way around. I mean, uh, uh, because you see that uh, if this is true, you just reverse your steps and you rediscover that then the, the, field, the electric field is just uh, what we wrote before that comes from Coulomb's force. So you can go both ways, and this is really equivalent to, to, the, to this nice Coulomb uh, uh, force, the Coulomb's law, that maybe we write it here, that tells you that the force is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught in this unit if you have two charges, right, is the distance between these two charges square in the direction of this ra ra radius. So now we know that, and we have included everything that was known about forces between charges, static charges, into this law. Just to, 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 to repeat it, uh, this is equivalent to say what is in here, and what is, is in here is that you have a central force, remember, because it's like uh, the Kepler's problem in mechanics. This is a central force because it, it, it points in the direction of the other charge. So if you have a charge, you have a force that is pointing there. So it's a central force that uh, uh, goes like 1 over r square. This is the crucial information. And this information is translated into this uh, equation, OK, these two. And also remember that you have this superposition principle that we talk about because if you keep adding charges, then the force, uh, the, the total force is just the sum of the individual forces of all these charges. Okay, this seems trivial, but it's not. As I said, there are forces uh, in the world uh, that uh, do not obey this superposition principle, but here they do. So if you have to write, this was for two charges, but I, I can add a third charge, okay? I, I can have, uh, so the, the, the Coulomb force uh, on this charge from this one simply add to the Coulomb force coming from the, the third charge and the fourth and the fifth and so on and so, so forth. Uh, and this is encoded here. You see it's just a density of charge, so you can integrate over everything and you just sum up to these uh, total charges. So these three informations are in this uh, very simple uh, Gauss law on the divergence of the electric field. Mm? Questions? If not, uh, so this was the, uh, so let's uh, uh, stick now to the other equation and see what we get uh, out of this, okay? So uh, let me. That's a nice thing that, uh, you know, the two fundamental forces in nature, they essentially, they have the same force form that is gravity and electrostatics. 
but uh, the reason is that uh, it's, it seems that uh, nature likes to work with this kind of uh, uh, two-body forces in which uh, the total force is just the sum of all the other forces. And this happened for gravity, at least uh, Newtonian gravity and electrostatic, okay? You were about to... Yeah, I mean, as I said, uh, this is a density of charge. So, you know, you have charges all spread around. And you simply integrate and you get the total. So you take chunks. You can take three chunks of, of charges. It's like, then you integrate, you get three, ch three charges, and they sum up in this. In a way, it's, uh, in a way this is where the fact that you sum the charges to get the field is encoded in the fact that you can write the field uh, in a way because uh, you, you only know what happens here. You don't, you don't care about the, the other, right? So, mm. okay. So yeah. Why don't you apply T minus sign the energy? Well, this is the usual thing because the force, you remember like in, in classical mechanics, uh, you want the force to, to have the, you know, to, to be attractive in that case. So you put a minus sign here. We already discussed <laughs> this uh, in mechanics. Uh, yeah, but here, I mean, <coughs> the, the, the sequence is not always the total one. Right, so you, you, you are going to get that the, the w I mean, with this convention, you get the force from uh, opposite charges is, uh, is uh, attractive. And similar alike charges is re no. It's not conventional in the sense that we know that uh, charges with the opposite. Yeah, I mean th this is zero independently of this, right? Then this is part of what you call the potential, but. This goes in the same direction when we, we wrote, uh, this was the same as the, the force, the link between the force and the potential in classical mechanics, that we wanted that uh, by increasing the potential, you, 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 you were getting a, a, a larger force. And here it works the same. On top, here you have these things with the charges, with the sign that you have to. Okay, but uh, I mean, the crucial point is that you have a gradient here. Clearly the minus is there because I put it there. <coughs> so, um, what can we say about this? Maybe this, this is a, well, first two, two simple things. Uh, what are the pro properties of a scalar potential? Why is it called a potential, first of all? Uh, you know that this is, has to do with the fact that indeed this is a potential. That is something that only depends on the, uh, on the relative distances uh, between the, 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 the parts of your system, right? And this has to do that, uh, you know, this is equivalent, right? The fact that your vector field, uh, the, sorry, the curl of your vector field uh, vanishes through the Stokes theorem is equivalent to the fact that uh, if you take a, a, a line integral around, around the loop, uh, right, of your field, this, this this quantity vanishes. So this means that uh, if you start here and you go around and you come back here, right, and you do this integral, this gives you zero. Hmm? So this is the L vector. This is E. I go around summing up these components and I, I get zero. But you see this is really equivalent to what we know about a potential because if you have a potential, right, remember gravity means that uh, the potential here, the point A and the potential in the point B, right, and if you go from point A to point B, if you wish the work done does not depend whether you go this way or you go this way, right? This was the property of the potential. You don't, if I tell you that the potential here is f phi A and here is phi B, then the work is just uh, the difference of, no? And I don't have to tell you how I go from A uh, to B. And this is the, the real prop physical property of a potential. A potential is useful exactly for this. But you see that if this is true, this is exactly 
the fact that it doesn't matter which way you go, because since uh, if you integrate all around the loop, it gives zero, that means that uh, you can go this way or you can go this way, and you get the same. Hmm? So when I write that the, f the force is this charge times the, the electric field, right? And the work done, therefore, the work done in this, uh, in this field, if I take this charge and I move it in this field, the work done is, OK, you get the minus. So from point A and point B is, the, is what? The force, right? Work is always this line integral of the force along the L, OK? But I can replace the force with the, with the because of this definition, I can simply replace, uh, uh, I put the Q, uh, I guess I, pu I put a, a, a Q here, and then what I'm really doing is the integral of the E field along the L. And you see then this property comes here, uh, and uh, it is exactly what I told you, right? Because now I have to do this integral from A to B. This is the work done in moving my charge Q from A to B. And so you may wonder, this depends uh, on uh, which way I go from A to B. But no, because you have that uh, E is a curve-free field, it does not depend. Therefore, this, therefore, uh, therefore this uh, uh, can really be written as a potential. In fact, you, you verify that uh, because of this, I can write my E field as the gradient, as a gradient of a potential. So I have this minus here. So I get the integral from A to B of the gradient of this potential, of the gradient of this potential along this line. And then you see that exactly because of this, you get the simply is the integral from A to B of D phi. Right? Or Q times the potential in A, uh, sorry, in B minus the potential in A. So indeed, that is a potential. And uh, the difference uh, between the values of the potential in two different points of your field uh, uh, times the charge is the work to bring that charge from one point to the other one. It does not depend on, on, the, on the... So in the case of the Coulomb, you know that the, the force lines, right, are... Because the force is central, so it points along the direction of R. So if I have a charge Q here, my force lines are something like this, right? And therefore, the equipotential spheres or line on the blackboard are going to be just uh, you know, circles like this around this charge. Okay. So along these circles, really they are spheres. Uh, this is phi equals a certain value. It's constant along this line. And uh, you do work only by, by moving from here to here. You, you, you do some work. But it does not depend the way you go from here to here. It just depends how far you are from one point to the other, away from the. That's for the Coulomb field. That is the simplest one, for which you have that, those very simple. You see, it's nice to. This is the, the Faraday's way of uh, of doing uh, computations in uh, electrostatics, just by drawing the f force lines. Okay, so there are lines along. Uh, uh, along which the field is tangential. So in this case, the field is just uh, uh, radially uh, uh, with respect to the charge. And so they are straight lines. And then the, the, the equipotential, equipotential line, they are orthogonal to these force lines, right? Because they are the gradient, the gradient uh, there. Hmm? Uh, I made a mistake. Where work is minus uh, no, you see that. Well, I mean, 
Well, you, so, no, the conservative, it means that it does not depend on the, on the path. Yeah, so. I mean, it has to do with this, too. I think this is the correct. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I move from a point A to a point B, right? So. What's it, you, you say, uh, say again your point. So the yes. No, but uh, there is no kinetic energy here. Yes. No, I mean the. the But why, I mean, this is a positive change in, in, the, in the potential. If, if you pull it up, right? You, you start from here, you move it up. It's like in the gravitational field. So with this definition, from here to here, I'm doing some work. If, instead of from here to there, the system is producing work because you lose potential energy and you gain kinetic energy if you want. But here I just, put in positive energy in the system by doing some work with this definition. So I think it's, uh, it's always conventional. I mean, the poten remember the potential, I mean, uh, it's like in mechanics. It, it, it doesn't have an absolute meaning, okay? The, the only thing is the force. But the connection you put here is, uh, okay. <coughs> um, so, so much about Coulomb uh, law. Mm, maybe I should say just a, a very quickly, uh, you may wonder about uh, all the stuff that you learn about electric circuits, right? Because you say, wh wh where is Ohm's law, for instance? Here. Okay, it's here, obviously. <laughs> but... Uh, We won't be doing much about that. I mean, of course, that uh, is a huge subject by itself. Uh, but I assume you already know uh, uh, a lot uh, about all these things about circuits. Uh, we, if we have time, we will talk a little bit about more interesting circuits that are these oscillating circuits. Uh, but for that, we need uh, some extra information. So we will come back to that. But here, uh, uh, the, the Ohm, Ohm's law. The things that tells you uh, how the, the, the drop in uh, electric potential that we are talking about along, uh, say, a wire is uh, related to the, to the current. Uh, in this context, uh, you should think of the Ohm law not uh, uh, well, uh, as, a, as a density, right? So you see the, the density of current is proportional, let's call it sigma, to the electric field. Okay, so that's the... the differential form the, or, or the microscopic form. So these are densities. Uh, uh, and Ohm's law, it's an approximation, right? Like, uh, like uh, those relations that uh, we wrote uh, the other time between D and E, right? Because it's, in a way, it's a form of D because it's a very peculiar form because you, you put the electric field in a very strange and peculiar kind of matter that is a, a conductor. Okay, like a, a, a wire, uh, and that is a metal, and in the metals you have the electrons uh, uh, on, a, on a common band, and so they are sort of very much free to move about, and so you have an electric current, so that if the first electron moves a little bit, the, the, the last one moves more, and, 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 and you have this, okay? And uh, uh, so 
this approximation tells you that uh, uh, if you have an electric field uh, is proportionally directly proportional with some constant here that maybe is not really a constant if you have a wire with some structures because it may depend on the point right so this may be a, may be a function of the of the position and may even be a tensor um, unfortunately if the, the is not uniform right so but let's assume it's a thin wire so this is really just a constant and is uniform because that's what the Ohm's law is talking about a uniform thin wire conducting wire and there then there you have that the, the density of current is directly proportional to the to the field that you apply and so oh, so this is, is called uh, electric conductivity obviously and uh, so say one over this is going to be proportional to what we call the resistance that is the opposite you know? this is how easy it is to produce a current uh, by applying an electric field the resistance is just the opposite so I don't want to, to uh, just to, to make contact with what you knew about uh, this stuff uh, uh, in this language so uh, the, 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 the V the electric potential right is exactly like I wrote it before, the, uh, so you have a wire, uh, uh, two A and B, right? So this is going to be just, uh, uh, well, like, let's call it one and two, that is easier. It's just the difference between the potential uh, that I wrote there between these two points, right? So you just do an integral uh, uh, between two and one and D phi. So this is the drop in electric potential uh, uh, between two points on, on your wire and uh, uh, <coughs> or you, you can also put uh, I guess uh, I should put a minus and uh, by the usual thing uh, uh, this uh, d phi what is it is the gradient right of phi times the ds, the surface, the little ds, uh, I mean the, the little uh, ds, not the surface, the little dl along uh, this, uh, this wire. But uh, this is uh, minus the gradient of phi is what we call the, the electric field, right? So this is just, uh, and then uh, by Ohm's law, I can rewrite the electric field there as this integral between J dS uh, divided by what I call this uh, conductivity, the electric. Uh, now, if I assume that everything is uniform, so this is a wire that is uniform and everything is nice, so then J, right, uh, uh, times this little area is just. Uh, what I call the electric current, that is the current that goes. So I can pull it out and I'm left with an integral over this ds uh, divided by sigma a, where a is this uh, uh, cross section. And I guess this is what you call, this, this is what you call uh, R, the resistance of the wire. So okay, nothing really deep here, but just to just to 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 say that we are still doing what uh, you learn about electric circuits. It just we are doing it using these uh, uh, differential forms that uh, it's uh, more appropriate when discussing fields. But at the end of the day, you you recover uh, Ohm's law that I guess is this one: v equal to. And, and later on, we will see that uh, you, we can recover also the other that has to do with the inductance and the capaci capacitance of a circuit that are the other three, the other two properties. Um, 
So now I don't know whether to leave some stuff to to the exercises. Um, because uh, what is left about, about so uh, I mean there are two things that we need to know. How do I how do you use this uh, law to derive uh, the E field for different charge uh, distributions, right? Because after all, we want to solve these uh, equations and uh, and find the field. So this is the one point of view that is given given a certain charge distribution. That is this. What is E, right? I guess this is what you want to know. That means solving this equation means exactly this. So, of course, this is really part of the homeworks. I mean, I give you some charge distribution, and 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 you uh, by solving that or by doing some other or by using Coulomb's law or whatever, you, you come up with the electric field correspondent, the corresponding electric field, OK? So here we have a long series of homeworks. Have you, how much homeworks already? Just three. So we can. So then on Monday we saw. So summer I'll do it here together uh, today, and then the others we we, we do it uh, on, uh, on, uh, on on Monday together. Just to give you, an, as I said, I mean I give you a chart for, for me, but this I leave it as a homework. It's the next level of difficulties. So we, Coulomb law, uh, it's clear. You have a charge, you get the, the field through the Coulomb law. What happened? So this is the, the homework. So this is number four, I guess. Um, just just three. I, I think I, I remember more than three. No, you you you. What are these three problems? Tell me. No, the one that you are supposed to solve Monday. Yeah. Right. Yeah. OK. OK, so I mean, th those are really quick. So, uh, so Coulomb law has to do with one single charge, right? Uh, you have a single charge, you get the field that we know. So what happened uh, the next, you see this is something that will come up very often, because in a way it's, uh, it's very important, is the next uh, term in, in expansion. Uh, what happens if you have uh, uh, this other situation? You have two charges, two equal charges. Let's call it E. That is nice, like the electron. Uh, so plus and minus, OK? To a certain distance that I guess here I call it A. So not one charge, but two charges at a certain distance A. So what is the electric field of, of these two charges? If they are, you are far away, say, so you can do an exp so you are here distance r. So you want to write the field for this charge distribution. I know it's just a superposition of, as I said five minutes ago, of two Coulomb forces. But uh, do it uh, in a more interesting, because very often this happens that these two charges are very close to each other, and you are measuring the field very far away. Okay. So assume that. Uh, this r is much larger than a. You understand that you can do some expansions in this one over r square, and derive the the potential. So the potential phi, okay. I mean, I, I already know that this one over four pi epsilon zero uh, e r uh, say one minus e r two, where where this is r uh, one r. Are, are two, okay, but do the expansion in detail. Okay, do the expansion, and 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 uh, then you introduce this vector p. That is just the the distance a. Okay, so if you introduce some uh, some uh, axis, right? So that this is plus, and this is minus. So this p is the distance a 
times times uh, uh, so it, it's a vector that points uh, from minus to plus uh, so this way and the uh, and the value the absolute value is just a uh, 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 e so the charge this is called the dipole moment of this uh, distribution of charges is a very important quantity. So this is an important exercise. And you will see we come up uh, uh, over and over again because essentially, as we will discover, I guess, uh, on Friday, uh, when you have an arbitrary distribution of charges, you can do some expansions and then uh, you will have a, a leading term that is the monopole, that is like having that charge that distribution of charge all concentrate in some point. Then you have the dipole, that is the first correction that comes from something like this. And then you keep on going. You have the quadruples and so on and so forth. By the way, this is completely equivalent in gravity because it's the same kind of force, right? Uh, and, uh, and there too, if, as I said, right, uh, already I told you, if you look at the sun, you have a first term that is the monopole. Then there you don't have the dipole terms, as I told you, because you don't have, I mean, E, uh, there is no minus E because ma the mass is always attractive. So this term is zero. So the first correction is a quadrupole. So the first correction to the orbit of the Earth due to the fact that the sun is not a, 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 a perfect sphere is a quadrupole correction, not a dipole. But for the electric field, this dipole is there. And of course, it's very important. Uh, you will see it, it, it comes up everywhere. When, uh, when you listen to the radio, the radio on your car or at home, uh, that radiation is essentially due to dipole radiation. That is, you have two charges moving, uh, and that is an antenna. It's called a Marconi antenna, and that is the simplest way to produce a, 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 an electromagnetic wave, and, and then on this frequency, you modulate that, and you, you listen to all the nonsense that comes through the radio. OK. So try this uh, simple exercise. So, uh, so the exercise is first compute the potential, assuming this thing I told you, that uh, this distance A is much smaller. So I want uh, uh, some expansion in this, right? So write the potential. So you, you must be able to write this potential in terms of this dipole moment. <coughs> Maybe I write it here so it's easier. Verify, so let's turn it around. Verify that the potential is, is this, where P is what I define it there. And it points from minus E to plus E. So you see, it's a field that goes like 1 over R square and is proportional proportional to, to this dipole moment. Two, compute the electric field. OK. So you must, so here you start cranking in this uh, uh, calculus, vector calculus. So you have to take the components and take gradients of the component. And you, you derive the electric field that maybe I write that too so that it, you check. So if I call, so I write it this form, E3. So this is a, a unit vector in the direction of R. Minus P. So this is the electric field that goes like a cube right here. So this is a unit vector in the direction. So this is the projection of this vector in this direction, OK? So just check that this is um, draw three, draw this, draw the force lines of this field. Okay. So I don't know. You have uh, this is P. Then you draw your. Here you will get all the components, so you will be able to draw the force lines. They look something like this.
Um, is this clear? Can I? So this is it's it's an example, a very important example of uh, how you get the field uh, uh, by means of using Coulomb's law directly. Okay, so that's the easiest thing. I, I didn't. We could have done that the first day without introducing all this Maxwell stuff. But uh, then you can also uh, say, well, I want to use Gauss law. Uh, and uh, so I want to compute uh, the uh, electric field directly from uh, Gauss law. And you understand that uh, unless the geometry of your charge distribution is particularly simple, this is going to be complicated, right? Because if this guy is very strange, then you need to do some strange integral to get E, right? Uh, to solve this uh, uh, these uh, differential equations, uh, and then uh, you need a computer, essentially. But if the geometry is very simple, then uh, you are very much uh, uh, in luck, uh, because then uh, it's, uh, you, you know, you, you think of this equation in the integral form, and then if the geometry is simple enough, uh, then uh, you may be able to do the integral just by, you know, if it's uniform distribution with the simple geometry, the integral, as I did, improving the, uh, the, the relationship between this and Coulomb law, it, you don't really have to do the integral because everything is uniform, so you, you sum up. Uh, uh, so maybe if I give you an example, this is, <coughs> it's even, uh, so uh, the, the simple example, so this is an example, is if you have a, a distribution of charge that is simply a, an infinitely long uh, line, right? You have an infinitely long line charged. What is the field, what is the field around this, this charge distribution? So we, we, dis we, we discover what the field is for a point charge, and it's the, it's the, the Coulomb field. Uh, the next, you know, it's like a Euclidean geometry. After the point, you have the line. So, okay, the, here's the line. So instead of having just a point charge, you have a line uh, infinitely small but infinitely long that is charged. And how do you define the charge there? Well, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, so let's assume that it has a, a uniform ch charge density per unit of length, and I call it lambda because it's the Greek equivalent of L. And you see that now uh, it's rather simple because all I have to do is to think of that Gauss law in term of integrals that tells me that the surface integral of the normal component of E, right, around the surface is equal to the volume uh, of uh, the, in the, vo the, the, the volume integral of the density of charge included in the surface. So here I just have to be clever and take, so I take as my surface just a cylinder like this going along uh, this line. So this is my surface integral, okay? Therefore, the, the electric field, right, the normal component of this field is like this. And therefore, I have that locally here, right? I have that E, the, the normal component, is just 2 pi so if I call this, this distance r, is 2 pi r, right? This is the, then I should integrate along the entire line, but I take just the unit, the unit of, uh, of length. So per, per unit length, this is the surface integral. And that tells me that what, how much charge is inside this little volume, the unit volume is, uh, is, uh, uh, is lambda, right, by definition. So the, here I put lambda, and I have this famous uh, epsilon zero. So you see, in this case, I get immediately that my uh, electric field, uh, first of all, is pointing uh, normally to this wire. This because of the symmetry, right? I mean, uh, and then the 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 the. Uh, the value of this field is just lambda divided by 2 pi epsilon naught, 1 over r. So here the field does not 
drop like 1 over r squared, like for the single charge, it goes down like 1 over r. So it's lower because you have a DC infinitely long charge, so the field is stronger. No, the charge is, uh, is, is, is uniformly distributed along this wire. Now this is the integral. Now this is the integral. This is the integral. This is the the integral would, will also this infinitely long, but I just compute by unit length. So let's call this uh, e one l equal one. So I do this integral. This is what it is. So if you want here you have a delta l, delta l. But uh, of course if you integrate you get, uh, but you have an infinity, an infinite value here and there, so you sort of drop it. So that's why it's called by unit, uh, by unit length. So you see, if the geometry is forgiving, uh, then uh, you can do that right uh, very simply. Uh, the next level, I guess, so point, line, the next level is a plane following a classical geometry. And so you may wonder, so this was uh, the field for a, a, a line charge. So what is the, the, the field for a uniform sheet of charge? Right, so it's a plane, an infinitely uh, large plane covered with a certain charge, right? So it's like something like this. Infinitely long charge. So how big is the, is the field? So this is a uniformly charged plane. Again, I do the same trick, right? I use a small, my, for, for my volume, here it's a bit, uh, like this, it's a little bit, so you take, as uh, again, you, you take a unit volume and, and, you, uh, and you integrate. So this is your Gaussian surface over which you do your integral. And again, this integral is equal to the total charge inside the volume, uh, uh, inside the surface. And so let's call uh, now, again, the, this is a uniformly charged uh, sheet of, of, of something. Uh, it has, uh, let's call sigma, again, this is the unit, uh, the density uh, of, of surface charge per unit area. Okay, like before, it was the density of charge uh, per unit of length. So again, because of the symmetry, the electric field should be uh, on both sides, something perpendicular to to the plane, right? Because there is no way that uh, it can it, it, it cannot be perpendicular. So uh, you have uh, you take this very uh, small. Uh, it, it has no component uh, on the side, so there is no leakage. So if you call this unit of area A, uh, you simply have that uh, on this side you have E times this area when you take the the integral of the normal component of E. So I keep on pointing here, but I keep on thinking of the integral form. So I hope at this point uh, it, it is clear for you. I mean, they must be completely equivalent in your mind. So I point here and I say, uh, so you may wonder what, what, is, what, what is he saying? I mean, there is no integral there, but there is an integral if you use uh, the, the integral form of that. So I have from this side and also on the other side, so I have, this is the, the, the total flux of E outside this little tiny box. And this must be equal to 1 over epsilon naught, right, this one, the, the integral over the volume included in this little box uh, of the charge inside. So this is just sigma, right, and uh, sigma times the, the, the area. So again, the, the unit area, you see, can drop, drop out. Uh, and you get that the electric field, uh, a, a, a arbitrary point here, right, because this I can move it 
uh, up uh, is just uh, sigma divided by 2 epsilon 0. So the, the field gets bigger and bigger because now it's constant. So you can be very far away from this infinite sheet of charge and the field is uh, the same as if you were very close. So there is no way to know how far you are from these things. Okay. Actually, uh, again, if you are thinking of Ohm's law and all this kind of stuff, the, this sheet of charge should suggest to you the idea of the, of, um, of the capacitor, right? The capacitance of a system. Uh, you, uh, so maybe, well, uh, uh, the next thing, uh, I mean, uh, what happens if you take two of these planes, these two charge sheets, uh, you put one next to the other, right, like this, uh, and also you take uh, uh, opposite charges, the, the density of charges of one is as the opposite sign. This is a very well-known component of many electric circuits, even though there is not, I mean, in the computer is not realized with this, uh, with this uh, uh, metal, uh, metallic planes, but uh, the idea is the same. So what is the, uh, uh, the electric field between these two sheets? Yeah. Okay, so I'll leave it as a, since you already know. So this is homework number six, I guess, now. So what is the field inside? So it's the generalization. Here's just one sheet. And there you have two of these uh, uniformly charged sheets of charges with the opposite charge, okay? So call it still sigma. And, and what is the electric field inside? Also, what is the electric field outside? Zero. Okay. Minus sigma over zero. Zero, okay. Then, the ex okay, so that's you already know. So, but then please compute the potential. So the potential due to that field inside and prove that uh, you have that this potential, let's say call it V, well, that you know, uh, 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 is equal to uh, the, uh, let's call it, uh, Uh, okay, can be written in this form, right? So this is the, the, the charge that you put here. And this new quantity that is the, the capacitance is equal for this, uh, for this case is equal to epsilon naught, the, the area, the unit area, divided by the distance, the distance between these two plates. Again, a result that uh, you may already... Probably no. This is just okay. It's a, it's a simple exercise just to, to connect with what uh, you know about these uh, things uh, that is this macroscopic quantities like the capacitance. And if you feel really inspired, you could do the same for for a, for for for, uh, for two spherical shells, right? Meaning, instead of a plane, I take a shell and then another shell, metallic shell, inside the first one. So I call R, I guess uh, I call it R1 and R2, the, the radii of these two shells. And, and you put a, a, a charge Q on the, on the inner one and a charge minus Q on the, on the outside. And you do the same trick. You compute the potential, right? You divide the potential by the charge, and you get uh, the capacitance. And so the capacitance is this charge Q. So maybe here should be Q. Uh, divide by the potential. So you, co you compute the field. You compute the potential. Then you take Q over, over the potential, uh, uh, and you get this, this uh, 
quantity, why this quantity is single out? Why we single out the capacitance in the system? Because you see, it's a purely geometric quantity. It has nothing to do with the charge. Uh, uh, it's a geometrical quantity that uh, is completely defined when you give the geometry of your system. So for the two uh, infinitely uh, uh, large uniformly char charged planes, it's just this. And I want you to, to do the exercise and show that for this charge distribution, two spherical shells, one inside the other, is just given by some ratio of this radii. In fact, it's the product of the of R1 times R2 divided by the sum, uh, the, the difference. I mean, this is also known as 1 over R1 minus 1 over R2, obviously. Uh, I mean, one over, one over. <coughs> okay. So I mean, of course, we can keep on going. Uh, <coughs> but. Uh, So let, let's just uh, stop here with the, I mean, for, for the exercise. Uh, of course, a byproduct of that exercise is that uh, by means of the Gauss law, it's very easy to, to compute what is the potential inside a, sh a charged shell. OK, so that you can do too. But it's pretty obvious that uh, it is 0 because of the, of the property of that, right? So if you have charges on a, on a, on a metallic shell, they distribute themselves in such a way to, to make 0 the potential inside, OK? That's also true for, for, the, for gravity. I mean, if you, if you have a, a gravitational shell, uh, the gravitational field inside the shell is zero, OK? This has, it, it only comes from Gauss law. It only comes from the 1 over r square uh, uh, dependence of the force. So a way to screen yourself from the electric field is to go inside a, a, a metallic shell. What is the electrostatic potential energy? OK, so let me just, uh, uh, I want to write, uh, because it will come in uh, uh, important uh, uh, later on. Uh, I want to write the potential energy. So uh, the potential energy, right, now I call it W uh, 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 for, a, for, for a, a, a certain charge, so I for a charge QI due to the potential at that point, OK, uh, uh, it's, it's easy because we know that the potential there, due to all other charges around, right, because of this superposition principle, is just 4 pi naught, then the sum of all these charges. That's what I said. Uh, so let me sum from 1 to n minus 1 so that I have the one left. So qj, and then the distance between uh, Right? This is Coulomb law one more time. And now I want to massage these things in such a way to get uh, uh, the, the total energy, right? Uh, it then it's going to be just the sum of this. The total energy is just 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Then you sum over uh, uh, all possible uh, charges qi, so from 1 to n, and then you sum. Uh, you, you put that, that is the j from, uh, say, in this case, j less than, than i, right? Because they go one, you know, uh, two bodies. So the total energy in this system, because of the interaction of the i charge with all the other n minus 1 charges, is this sum, double sum, of the products of this. Very good. 
but now, so that, that is what uh, we already know. Uh, now I want to switch to this uh, density of charges because I want somehow to bring in the electric field. So I can replace all these uh, uh, charges and these sums with some integrals, right? And, and I have a, 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 a because I, 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 at this point, if I integrate over the all volumes, uh, I get the factor of two too, too much. So I divide by that. So I get a pi naught. Then I replace these sums, right, <coughs> by two integrals over the volumes d3 v d3 v prime of some density of charges at the point R in this volume and a point R prime in this other volume. And downstairs, I just have this one over R dependence that is characteristic of the electric potential. OK? But you see that uh, uh, this, this part here of, of, the, of the integral, so this integral here, is just, I can rewrite, it's just the, it's just, you see, it's just the potential uh, in the point R. So that quantity is 1 half, well, let's, let's do the, the intermediate step, it's 1 over 8 pi epsilon naught, uh, what? Uh, yeah. So this, you see, this is just the potential due to this charge distribution in the point R. So that I can write, I mean, 1 of 4 pi epsilon is the potential. So I get 1 half. Then I can integrate the density in the point R, and instead of doing the other integral, that integral itself is just the potential in R due to the, uh, the other dis charge distribution, right? So this uh, is, again, the, the, the potential, the, the energy of a system of charges written in terms of the density of charge in R and the potential due to the other charges computed in R, and then you integrate over this volume. And now I can use the The, uh, yes. Which one? This, this, or this? Uh, this one. I take. The, you see, this is the potential in the point R. So, if I rewrite this in terms of the charge density, this is exactly what I call the potential. So, I can rewrite this part here of the integral. Well, not this one, but uh, as uh, exactly, yeah, this one too, as exactly as the potential. Then I, I just have to do the remaining integral over the volume V. And why I'm doing this? Because now I, I use the, you see, if I, if I use Gauss law and I apply this to the, to, to the uh, d phi, right, d phi, you see, uh, uh, with the minus, this is equal to rho epsilon naught. Okay, but this, the divergence of the gradient is what? Is this delta square, right? This is an equation that we are going to discuss. So if I, if I use this, tw I mean, if I put this scalar potential into the Gauss law, I get this equation, remember, that we derived the other time, and I call it the Poisson equation. This we are going to discuss in, a, you will see, a, in, a, in even in many details next time. But uh, let's just take it from a, as a consequence of Maxwell equations, and I can put it inside here, right? Because you see this integral, this rho, I can use the Poisson equation and rewrite it as, a, I have a minus, so minus epsilon naught divided by 2, then I have this phi, and then I have the Poisson integral, uh, the Poisson in, uh, equation in this form. So through the, I, I replace rho, the density of charge, by means of the Poisson equation, that is just Maxwell equation. So I go from here to here. And then I do this integral by parts, by parts. <coughs> 
to get uh, so by part I have one part that goes very far away and as usually I drop it and minus so I get epsilon 0 divided by 2 so the minus become a plus and then you see by parts I have the this becomes just the, the gradient and then I have a gradient acting on the first function so in other words I just have a gradient square right but what is the gradient of phi this is just the electric field so this is a very nice expression because I have that the square of the electric field integrated over the volume is just the, the energy of the system or if you want you can define a energy density that is a little w such that when you integrate over the volume you get the total energy uh, your energy density if, if you have uh, an electric field is just this so in a region of space where you have an electric field you have a density of energy that is just like this essentially this depends on the units but is, is uh, just proportional to the square of the lengths of your electric field okay okay I stop here because I have to catch this bus but uh, uh, this will uh, will come useful because then we will see what is the contribution of the B field to the energy of the field uh, uh, of the energy uh, of the total field in a certain point and that will be useful but uh, otherwise this is uh, okay so uh, next time we will start from here from the Poisson equation and essentially we will try to solve this equation so it's, so we, you, you have seen three three ways to solve Maxwell equation so you briefly either you use the the Coulomb law as uh, you are supposed to do for the dipole moment and then we discuss on Monday or you uh, use directly Gauss law if the geometry is simple enough again as we have seen for the wire and you try for the spherical shells and the third way as you see is uh, uh, by moving from Gauss law to the Poisson equations they, they have the same physics but this is sort of simpler uh, even though it doesn't look like uh, and then solve this systematically and they, that where most people in the 19th century uh, uh, try I mean they, they wanted to solve these equations in a systematic way and you will see there are several techniques that then are used in many different fields in physics as I said orthogonal polynomials are used here to solve uh, there is a very nice feature that uh, if you remember uh, in two dimensions in two dimension analytic functions you remember this analytic functions Z uh, you know <laughs> in two dimensions they are analytic they have this Riemann relations right that the cross partial derivatives in the X and Y direction and they are equivalent to this so all two dimensional electrostatic problems can be solved by if you find the analytic function satisfying the appropriate boundary conditions so that's where most of this stuff on analytic function comes from anyway so we will spend some time there and then move on